Hello sewers and welcome to this video sew along for the Bampton drawstring bag. This is the little bag that you were going to sew. It draws up at the top with some ribbon or cords and then opens nice and wide for everything that you want to store inside. And there are three, a small, a medium and the large. In this video I'm going to be sewing the large but the sewing instructions were exactly the same for each one. The first thing you need to do is download the sewing pattern. The sewing pattern is free and includes the pattern pieces for all three versions, small, medium and large. It also includes written instructions along with step-by-step -step photos. So if you don't want to watch the video, you can just use the written instructions at any time to make your bags. Hop on over to sewsimplebags.com, go to the shop page and look for the Bampton drawstring bag. It's free, so add it to your cart, check out and download. If you aren't sure how to download and print a PDF sewing pattern, don't worry, it's really easy. There are tutorials over on the Sew Simple Bags site. So go over to sewsimplebags.com, click on tutorials, and there you will find instructions along with step-by-step -step photos and screencast videos on how to download and print your sewing pattern. You don't have to print all of the pieces because there are three size pattern pieces. There is the small, which is made up of two sheets of paper, the medium, also made up of two sheets, and the large is made up of four sheets of paper. You can decide from the sewing pattern to print all of the sheets or just the ones that you want to sew. And again, check out that tutorial for downloading and printing tips if you aren't sure how to print out your sewing pattern pieces. Assembling the sewing pattern is easy. We'll look at that next. The first thing to do is to put our four pattern pieces together. So we're making the large, which means there are four sheets of paper to assemble to make the large pattern piece. Basically, it's just a big jigsaw puzzle. Now, in this one, there are little triangles here, which you match up. We've also got a circle in the center, which will be made up of these square, of these quarter circles here with the letter A. There's a number of ways that you can put your pattern pieces together. You can either cut off these edges, you see where there are lines here around the outside. You can cut off these lines and take away the empty margins or to make it perhaps a little easier and quicker, you can just fold those over. So I'm going to match these two pattern pieces together. So I'm going to just fold over this one edge just here. So using this line as a guide, I'll fold over this part. And now, as we put the two together, you can see that the two triangles match up here to make a square. Suddenly the edges of our lines are all meeting up nicely. And up at the top here, we now have a semicircle. So once I've got that together, I can just take a couple of pieces of tape and hold those in place. You, where we have something which is going to be cut off, for example here, the description of the pattern. I don't need to tape this part here because I'm just going to cut around the line here and this part will fall away. So, hold those in place. Then if I bring in these two pieces, I'm going to deal with these two exactly the same. So I'll fold over this one. and match it on the top. I'm a little bit off there, so let's just correct that. And now that matches up beautifully. A little bit more tape. And now we have two pieces, so I'm going to fold over this top edge so that it will meet up here. I could also trim it off if it got a little bit too thick, 
it might be easier to trim. Okay, and now these pieces match. My triangles become a square. All of my lines match up beautifully here on the pattern. And I'll just tape that in place. that's it my pattern piece for this is now assembled and all we have to do is cut out around the outside of the pattern piece now it's going to be much easier to assemble your pattern first and then cut it out if you were to start cutting out all of the pieces and then try to assemble them afterwards it's actually more difficult to do it that way so always better to assemble and then cut it out and I'm just going to take a pair of regular household scissors don't use your fabric shears for cutting paper because it will uh, dull the blade sooner and just cut out around the outside. So I'll meet you back here when our pattern piece is ready. So that's it, my pattern piece is now ready and we can read our instructions here. We need to cut two pieces of our outer fabric, cut two pieces of the lining fabric and optional cut two pieces of interfacing. So let's do that in the next section. Now it's time to use our pattern piece to cut our fabric. I've selected two fabrics. This mustard uh, yellow colour print is going to be my outer fabric and then I have this grey solid which will be my lining fabric. I've also selected a lightweight interfacing. I'm using this one from Heat and Bond. It's an iron-on lightweight interfacing. And I think this will work well for this pattern. You don't want to use anything too heavy because this bag is going to cinch up. It's going to draw in. So if you had anything too stiff and too heavy, it would kind of little bit, be a little bit bulky. So pick something lightweight, but interfacing on all of these sizes, the small, medium and large is always optional. So let's have a look at how you use your pattern piece to cut your fabric. There are basically three different ways. In this example, we're cutting two of the same. So uh, we're going to use our outer fabric first and we need to cut two. There are two ways you can do it. You can either take your fabric and leave it double layered as I have here. I've got the wrong side of the fabric, the unprinted side together. And I could put my pattern piece on top and cut around it twice and I would get two identical pattern pieces. Or if you prefer, you can just use one layer of fabric and cut out each piece twice and you'll get the same effect. The reason why you might want to cut it one layer at a time is if you have a fabric with a large print, for example, and you had um, a feature, a part of that fabric right here, you might want to center that more or less in the middle of your pattern just there. But if your fabric is double layered, sometimes that's more difficult to do. And so you might want to cut your fabric one layer at a time. Now, in terms of how you decide to actually cut the fabric, there are three basic ways. You could take your pins. And once you have your pattern piece where you want it, you can just pin your pattern piece to the fabric all the way around and a couple of pins in the middle. And then you can use your fabric shears to cut around the outside of your pattern piece. So that's number one, pin your pattern to the fabric and cut it with fabric shears. Or you can take a fabric marker. In this case, I'm using a friction pen, which is heat erasable. So when I draw a line on my fabric and go over it with an iron, the line disappears. And these are my favorite fabric markers. So you could take your pen, put, place your pattern piece on the fabric, mark around the outside, 
Whoop. And then where you have your line, you can use your fabric shears to then cut out your pattern piece. So that's method number two. Method number three would be to use a rotary cutter, one of these. Be very careful with these because it's basically like a razor blade with a handle. The, nut, the knife here is extremely sharp, so do take care. And again, you can either pin your pattern piece to your fabric so that it stays still while you cut, or you can use fabric weights. I like to use uh, cans of tuna. So I'll put a couple of cans of tuna just here because they are flat, they're, they're lower, uh, lower profile. Put a couple of cans of tuna to hold it in place and then I can just cut around the outside with my um, rotary cutter. So that's three ways that you can cut out your fabric. For me, I prefer the method using the rotary cutter. So I'm going to go ahead now, I'm going to cut out two pieces of fabric two pieces of my grey lining fabric and then also two pieces of interfacing. The interfacing is cut exactly the same way as you would your fabric. Lay out your uh, interfacing, make sure it's nice and flat, put the, fat, put the pattern piece on top and cut it out. Our fabric pieces are now cut. I have two pieces of the outer fabric, two pieces of the lining fabric and two pieces of our lightweight fusible interfacing. So talking of interfacing, now it's time to fuse our interfacing to the outer fabric. So let's take these out of the way. Our fusible interfacing will always come with some kind of instructions. So if you have a look on the back of the packet for this one, it says to preheat our iron to a wool or medium heat setting with steam, uh, cut our fusible interfacing to size and shape, place the rough side of the fusible interfacing onto the back of the material to be bonded, cover with a dry pressing cloth and hold down with medium pressure for 10 to 15 seconds. So let's have a look. These are our pieces of outer fabric. So I'm going to turn this one with the wrong side up. This is the right side, the more brightly printed side, and this is the back. And this is where we want to fuse our interfacing. Our sheets of interfacing are again are double sided. They have a right side and a wrong side. The smooth side here is the right side. This is what you want to be facing up. And on the back, if you look very, very carefully, you can see little dots and you can also feel them with your hand. If you look rub, close, uh, rub gently, they're a little bit rough. And these are actually the dots of adhesive. So what we never want to do is iron our fusible interfacing with the glue side up because then it will just stick to the iron rather than stick to the fabric. And that's going to be a right sticky mess. So we place it with the glue side or the rough side down onto the wrong side of our fabric. And these should match up having been cut with the same pattern piece. Sometimes when you cut your interfacing, you may be told to cut it excluding seam allowances. So if we go back to our original pattern, here around the outside we have our cutting line. We also have a dotted line on the pattern here, which represents our stitching line. So if you were told to cut your interfacing excluding seam allowance, you would cut off this part of the pattern to the dotted line and then use the slightly smaller pattern piece to cut your interfacing. In this case, it's the exact same size as our outer piece, so no cutting or trimming is necessary. So they asked us to use a pressing sheet. These are the type of sheets that I like to use. This is actually a, a Teflon pressing sheet and they come in packs. Typically, I've got a pack of three and I like to put one down on my ironing board or ironing surface first to protect it. And then I will put my, um, my pieces to be fused on top and use another sheet on top again, just in case there's any little bits of sticky around the outside, that prevents it sticking to the ironing board and also to my iron. So once everything is in place, don't worry if it's slightly off, that's all going to be fine. And then we just take our iron, turn to a medium setting and use steam, and then you'll just press it in place 
over the fusible interfacing with some slight pressure for around 10 to 15 seconds. Move on to the next section, another 10 to 15. Move on again, 10 to 15. So this can be quite a lengthy process. As you can see here, I'm using a small iron because typically I make small projects. You can also use a household iron to fuse your interfacing. There's no reason why not. Once the entire interfacing is fused, I recommend that you leave it in place until it's cool. If you do pick up the fabric and interfacing right away, the, the glue is still hot, therefore it's still sticky, and it, I can at that point actually come away from your fabric. So I recommend once the piece is fused, leave it in place until it's cool, and then it's safe to move it without the interfacing coming away. If you do notice in future that your interfacing has come away or has bubbled a little bit and you notice that on the outside, you can bring it back to your ironing board, refuse again with your iron for a little while until the heat um, makes the glue tacky again and remember then to leave it to cool before you move it. So I'll fuse my interfacing now to both pieces of my fabric and then we'll re be ready to sew. The first step in our sewing is to take the two pieces of lining fabric. If your lining fabric is a patterned one, you place the two pattern sides, the right sides of the fabric together so that the wrong sides are facing to the outside. And we need to sew around this curved edge. So you can use pins or you can clip your fabric in place so that it's not going to move and shift while you're sewing. It's gonna make things easier. And we're going to start at one end and follow the curved edge all the way around until we get to the other end. We don't sew across the top. We need to sew with a half inch seam allowance. I've measured on my machine and my needle to the edge of the presser foot is just under half an inch. So that gives me a great guide. But if you need some further help with, with your seam allowance, then certainly mark a half inch all the way around. No one's gonna know. It's just a little cheat line and it will help you keep an accurate seam allowance. So let's take this over to the machine. I'll move my first clip out of the way and put my presser foot down so the needle is just a little bit forward of the edge of the fabric and I will use my reverse button to just take the machine back a little bit towards the edge of the fabric. And now when I sew forward, the stitches will be locked in place because they will be double at the end so that they won't come undone. And I'm gonna take it nice and slow. Sewing a straight line is fairly easy. Sewing around a curve, the machine can get a little bit away from you. So take it nice and slow. So I'm keeping an eye on the edge of my presser foot and where my needle is falling to keep an accurate half inch seam allowance and remove the clips as I go. I will use my hands to gently swivel the fabric, pivot it a little bit to help go around these curves. If you notice at any point that you are making your seam allowance a little too large or too small, by all means pick up the presser foot if you need to, shift the fabric so that it's nice and flat and continue sewing. Remember to move your clips or your pins in good time so that they don't get in the way of your presser foot. Otherwise, if you hit a pin or a clip, you can either damage your needle or certainly your seam allowance won't be accurate.
once you get the hang of it, you can pick up speed and go a little faster. So I reversed my stitches again at the end just to lock them in place. Once your seam is sewed you have two options. You can clip into the seam allowance using a pair of regular scissors around every inch and you'll do this along the curved section but not on the straight sections. So at the top here, where the sewing is straight, you no need to clip, clip that part, only clip where the seam allowance is curved. Be careful not to clip into the stitches that you already have in place. That's option one. Option two is to use pinking shears. When your lining fabric is turned right side out and this is down in the seam allowance of your bag, having some clips into your seam allowance will allow the fabric here to lie a lot flatter. So it gives a nicer finish. You can also use pinking shears. So these are, these are the scissors that have the serrated edge and they cut tiny little notches out of your fabric. It gives it a ni nice neat finish too and it will also by reducing the size of the seam allowance, help it to lie a little flatter in the bottom of your bag. Again, if you choose to do this, don't cut the sides where the stitching is straight. Just notch around the area where this, the seam is curved around the bottom of the bag. And again, make sure not to cut into your stitching. By the way, a link to all of the tools that I'm using in this video can be found in your pattern download. And that's our lining finished. We can set that aside for now. Now let's work on the outer pieces of our bag. We need to bring back in our pattern piece and on the wrong side of these outer pieces, we just need to make a mark within the seam allowance for where our casing is gonna be. Our casing area here across the pattern is where the drawstring will go, either the ribbon or the cord. So if we sew through this part, then we won't be able to slide the ribbon through later on. So we just need to remind ourselves not to sew. So where the casing line comes to the edge of the pattern, I'm just going to mark across there on my seam allowance, the same for the upper and the lower casing amount. The same over here on this side. Don't need to go all the way across, just mark within my seam allowance, pretty roughly will do. And that reminds me to sew above and below but not here. So you could even put a cross there if you like to remind yourself not to sew in this part of the pattern. Now we don't need strictly speaking to mark the other side but I will go ahead and do that anyway. Here, not to sew there and again on the other side. not to sew here. Okay, so let's place our two outer pieces right sides together. So the good side of the fabric, the printed side, those two sides go together. And on the outside, we should be seeing the wrong side on both sides, including our interfacing if you've used it. Now I'll go ahead and either pin or clip all the way around the outside.
we have to remember not to sew this area of our casing. So I'm going to start by stitching on the lower marked line, sew around the curve edge and finish when I get to the lower line on the other side. Remember to use your same seam allowance and also to backstitch at the start and end of your stitching to keep everything secure. Now that you have a little bit of practice in sewing curved seams, you can probably sew a little faster. You may also notice that if you have interfaced your fabric, that it's a little bit more steady, a little bit more stable, because the interfacing just adds a little bit more body to it. And here I'm coming up to my mark, so I'm going to finish stitching at this lower mark for the casing. And then back stitch to secure. Now the bottom edge is stitched, it's time to sew at the top. And I'm gonna start stitching from the upper mark up to the top on both sides, leaving this area free without any stitching. and I'll repeat on the other side. This time with our seam allowances, we won't do anything above the second line, the lower line on our casing. Underneath, you can again use your pinking shears and you can cut your seam allowance down if you like, or you can also notch with scissors. So this time you can take out some little notches. There's a difference when you sew between clipping and notching your seams. Seams that are going to turn in on themselves, like this seam, when we turn it the right way in, this way, this, this seam will turn to the shorter side. And therefore we need to take some of the fabric away by notching so that when, it's the, when the seam turns to the shorter side, the notch takes out the excess fabric and allows that seam allowance to, to lie nice and flat. And we can do that either with the pinking shears or you can do it with your regular scissors by cutting some notches. And continue this all the way around the curve, but not up to and beyond the point here where your casing is going to be. Once you've notched around the curved edge of your seam, you may want to just finger press the little notches open. And basically we're pressing the, the notches away on either side and just finger pressing it to start with, just so that they are going to lie nice and flat when we turn it the right way later on. 
I suggest starting by just finger pressing these to open them up. And continue that all around and then take it over to the ironing board and do the same thing with your iron. By pressing these seams around the curve open and flat against the body of the bag, you'll get a much neater finish around the bottom of your bag later on. So I'm just going to finish pressing these with my fingers, then take it over to the sewing machine, uh, take it over to the ironing board and do the same there. Now my outer piece is completely pressed and you can see why it was so important to cut the notches in the fabric. If we hadn't cut the notches when it was pressed, it wouldn't lie flat. It would be too long in order to press it to the inside of the bag. But now that all looks neat. On the edges here, where our casing is and the straight part of our pattern, I've now pressed this seam allowance open so it's nice and flat. And you can see just here, the little hole, which is the casing where the ribbon or the cord will go later on. So I've done that on both sides of my outer fabric. I've also gone ahead and pressed my lining fabric the same. So here we are in the seam allowance. This is also pressed nice and flat on both sides. Of course, in our lining, we don't have the little hole. So now it's time to start assembling our bag. We will take our outer fabric and turn it inside out so that the good side of the fabric is on the outside and our seam is hidden. And now is a good time to just run your finger or your fingernail along that seam. Make sure everything is sitting nice and flat. And when we pop that down, just roll the seam a little bit between your fingers. And as you smooth it out, you can see how smooth that curve becomes. That's because of the way we made the notches in the seam allowance and then pressed the seam open so that now everything is lying nice and smooth and flat and we've got no bunched up fabric around our curve. So we need to take the lining fabric and if your lining fabric has a pattern, the good side of the fabric will be on the inside. The good side of our outer is on the outside of the bag and basically the outer slips inside the lining so that the good side of the fabric, the right side of the fabric would be together. We are going to match them at the side seams. So where I have the nice flat side seam here from my outer, over the top I'm going to press the lining and you can see how nice and smooth and flat they lay because of the way that we press the fabric and the seams open and pop a clip on there. And then I will do the same on the other side, again matching up those seam allowances so both stitching lines are on top of each other and pop a clip there in place. And now when we lie it out, you can see how smooth and well everything is fitting. So here, we're also going to use our pins or clips just to hold this in place so that the raw edges are matching of our outer fabric and our lining fabric all around the top of the bag. So I'll go ahead and add some clips or some pins. Once the top edge is all neat and pinned or clipped in place, it's time for us to sew. But before we do that, we need to leave a gap because otherwise if we just sew all the way around the top, there'll be no way we can turn the bag the right side out. So I'm going to take a, a fabric marker and just mark a gap of around three or four inches here. And this is where I do not want to sew. So I'm going to start my line of stitching just here so all the way around whoops, in this direction and then as I come back through here I'm going to stop when I get to this point and leave this part here unsewn. So let's take this over to the sewing machine. We're going to use the same half inch seam allowance that we've used previously. So once I have this under my presser foot, I'll just reverse back a few stitches 
until I get to the point in my fabric where I've marked my line. This is where my gap is going to be from here. So I'm going to sew from this part forward. And I'm keeping the edge of my presser foot close to the edge of the fabric here to use as a guide so that I'm sewing my half inch seam allowance. Now that you've been used to sewing curved seams, going back to sewing this nice straight one will be easy. Make sure that your fabric and your seam allowances are lying flat as you get to this point where you have the folded fabric. I'm just going to take care again as I get to this point where I'm sewing over my seam allowances. And now I can see my reminders. I'm reminding that I'm sewing in this direction and I'm soon going to get to a point where I need to stop stitching. I can see my mark coming up. I stop stitching at that point, do some reverse stitches to lock them in place and remove it from the machine. One tip for you at this point, where you have your gap just here, I recommend taking this over to the ironing board and just pressing this fabric back in a straight line. You can start by finger pressing and you can see how it forms a nice straight line between your stitches just here like this. If you press this back with an iron and do the same on the other side, press this back, then you'll end up with a nice crisp edge here where your gap is. You see, if you do this, you get a nice crisp edge. Press that with your fingers and then press it with the iron. And when you come to sew later on, you'll already have a much neater finish. It'll be much easier to work with. So I'm going to go ahead and press mine now. Now let's turn our bag the right side out. We have this gap in the lining just here and we can just pop our fingers down in there and start to pull the fabric out through this gap. Take it carefully. We don't want to pop any of the stitches where this gap is. You can just go a little bit at a time. Eventually it will all pop out through there. There we go. So now we have all of our seams are hidden and we have our lining this side and the outer of our bag. So we just take the lining, pop it down inside the outer of the bag like this. And then around the top, it's helpful to just take the seam between your fingers and just roll it between your finger and thumb until everything starts to go nice and smooth. And basically what you're trying to do is exactly line up this seam here so that you have the lining on one side and the outer fabric on the other. And then you can just kind of draw your finger along here to smooth that out. And it takes a little while, 
You want to be nice and patient with it and just go around and smooth everything out, get everything nice and even and flat. Take your time. The more time you take doing, doing uh, things like this, the, ni the nicer and neater your projects will look in the end. So don't rush anything. So once you've been all the way around the top and you've smoothed out the top of your bag and your seams are all looking nice and even, everything should lie nice and flat. And you'll take it over to the ironing board and just give the bag a press. Take care to press really neatly around the top here so that the seam allowance is, so that the seam is all nice and smooth and even. And you can smooth out the rest of the bag and give that a press too. So I'm gonna take mine over to the ironing board, do that now, and then I'll be back. So now we've pressed the bag and it looks really nice and neat, but over the course of using it, it wouldn't stay like this. The edge wouldn't stay so neat and pressed. So what we can do is run a line of stitching around this edge really close to the top, and that will keep everything nice and neat in future during the time that we use it. As we sew around us as well, we will also come across this section here, which of course is open. And as we sew our line of stitching, that will automatically close this little gap too. So let's take this over to the sewing machine. I'm going to start and stop my stitching on one of these side seams here, just because that will be a little bit more uh, invisible during the time we use the bag. So we'll start here, sew all the way around and come back here. We don't need any kind of pins or clips because everything is so neat and smooth and pressed. But if you feel that clips and things would be beneficial, by all means, go ahead and use them. And we're gonna sew nice and close to the edge, around one eighth of an inch. You'll still want to back stitch so that you secure these stitches and stop them coming undone. And then as you go around, just make sure everything's lying nice and flat and smooth as you sew. As I come here to this gap in my lining, I'm making sure that I'm holding these edges right up close to each other. And I'll sew nice and slowly to make sure that I get a really good finish. So I'm using my fingers as pins to basically hold the fabric in place as I sew. Now I'm past the gap and I can continue sewing around the top of the bag. You might want to go a little slower over this point where the seams are, just because it's a little bit more bulky there. Coming up to where I started, so I'll come the stitches right up to where I finished these other ones and then back, 
back reverse a little bit to hold them in place. Our bag is looking great. If you would like to, you can go ahead and give it another press now. Now it's time to sew on these casing lines. These are the dotted lines that run across the pattern that are shown on the pattern piece here. And it's time to sew those on so that we have uh, this area where we can thread through our ribbon or cording. If you look on the side seam of the bag, you can see where we have our gap, just here, where our ribbon is gonna go. And you can see where the last stitch is before and after the casing. So I'm just going to make some little marks here and here with my fabric marker. Always remember to use a marker on the outside of your fabric that can be removed, like this one that is removed with heat. So I've got some marks here which indicate where my stitching is below that point and above that point, and this is where my casing is. So I'll mark exactly the same over on this side. And here for my stitch above. And now when I lie this out, I can see that I've got some marks on this side here and over on this side. So I'm going to get a ruler and actually join up those marks. So I've got a long quilting ruler and I'm just going to put it on one mark on one side and on the other side and then use my fabric marker just to lightly draw a line across. This will be my lower casing stitching line. And then I'll do exactly the same for the upper line. And as I take that away, you can see that we now have two parallel lines which are our stitching lines, and these are equivalent to the ones that was in our pattern piece. So I'll now mark equivalent lines over on the reverse, because remember we need to sew all the way around the bag. And the last one. Okay, so let's take this over to the sewing machine and we will stitch on these lines we've made. So again, I am starting and stopping my stitching on one of these side seams, just because it's a little less obtrusive than if we started somewhere in the middle. And I'll reverse my stitches to lock them in place and then stitch forward. And I'm just using my hands to smooth out and hold the fabric nice and flat so I don't get any puckers as I follow this line of stitching all the way around the bag.
I'm back here to my original side seam, so I'm just going to come up to the side seam, reverse the stitches, and then we'll start the next line. I'll trim those threads later. So let's repeat that exactly the same on the lower stitching line. Just trim off these threads and everything will, will look nice and neat. And there we go. This is the sewing of our bag now completed. So because my pen is heat erasable, I'm going to take this over to, this, to the ironing board and just press again so that it will remove the ink from these lines just here and give my bag a beautiful finished look. And that is our sewing completed. Now the sewing is completed, all we need to do is thread our ribbon or cording through the casing channel. You can use a commercially available bodkin or a large safety pin. You can also use something as easy as one of these hair clips. I can just thread the ribbon through snap the hair clip closed and it will hold the ribbon in place as I thread it through the casing channel. So we start from one side where we have our gap in the sewing just here and just thread, thread this through. Bunch it up a little bit, pull it out straight and we'll eventually make progress and the ribbon will be pulled through the casing. Take it nice and slow. You've uh, earned a reward now. Put the kettle on. You'll almost be finished and time for a cup of tea. Just take it easy as you get to this area here because we do have another hole just here and we don't want to come out. We want to go through and round and continue on through the other channel. So here we are coming out. I'm just going to pop that back in and continue on through. If the bag gets a little bit bunched up, a little bit cinched up, that doesn't matter. We'll sort that out at the end. Your ribbon should also be long enough that it hasn't come all the way through the casing. So you cut your ribbon according to the length and directions in the pattern, and then you cut it in half so that you end up with two equal pieces. And we'll start here with this first first piece and our clip here is about to come out this other side. I may need to put my finger in and just guide it. There we go and here it comes. So the ribbon should be flat, we shouldn't have twisted it at all as it came through. So once it comes out to the end, I'm just going to uh, Pull it through a little bit to make it easier. Make a loop and just pull a knot through to the end of the ribbon. 
There we go. So the ends are now knotted. So you can trim those off neatly and either use a little bit of fray check on the end of the ribbon or just pass them quickly over the flame of a candle just to melt the edges so that the ribbon isn't going to come undone. Now, so that's one side of our drawstring completed. And if you really wanted to, you could just operate the bag like that with just one string. But it's much easier, more convenient, I think, to use two. So where this time we started over here, started and ended on this side, this time we were going to start and end over on this side. So let's thread up our ribbon again. Pull it through, secure it into our hair clip. And now I'm going to do exactly the same, but starting on this side of the bag. Pull it through, bunch it up, pull it through. And I'll continue all the way around until I come out the other end. Once our ribbon emerges on the opposite side, exactly the same as we did before, give ourselves a little bit of room, tie those ends in a knot and slide the knot down towards the end of the ribbon. Trim off your ends and neaten them. And now your cinch up drawstring bag is completed. Pull on your drawstring from either end and there we go. If you like, you can always knot or tie your ends just to stop your bag reopening and anything falling out. So that's it, your bag is sewn. You're ready to cinch it up and put it with your other two. Thank you very much for watching this video and sewing along with me for the Bampton drawstring bag. I hope you've enjoyed it and if you would like to watch more sewing tutorials and videos in the future, don't forget to follow. See you again soon.